Happy Friday. I hope you had a very nice day yesterday. Even if around the world you weren't celebrating Thanksgiving, it's always a day to sit back and look around and try and look at the positive things we do have. Although that is not an easy task, I agree, in many cases. Dean Henderson is standing by for this first hour. Hello, Dean. Welcome. How was your day yesterday? Yeah, it was fine, man. Just uh, ate a lot of turkey. Old school. How about you? Uh, well, it it came and went. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what just me and Jill. He was chill. <laughs> we have kids. I suppose same with you, probably. Just, yeah. Well, I actually, uh, I had a very low-key day. Let's put it that way. Nice. All right. So we now, do it. Yeah. That's uh, what Better than a lot of people in Saudi Arabia are going through now. Have you been following this? I don't know what you've been following closely, but the Saudi royals and what's going on there is is really a scene. Uh, yeah. It's a big story. You've been on that, right? Yeah, I mean, as much as you can. Yeah, as much it, as we you know, can find out. <laughs> but, uh, Here, let me tell our listeners uh, a little bit about this, and then we're going to talk about this, because it, it really is important that, to understand that the Saudis are at the the root of so much of what uh, the Zionist state of Israel and the international banking cartel is perpetrating on the world. They're they're really the implementing foot soldiers in many ways, literally and and figuratively. Uh, the latest we have is that Crown Prince Mohammed bin salman who is supposed to be installed as king this week keep hearing that uh, he's still the crown prince is the guy who came on as the so-called uh moderate muslim uh in very much uh a reformist kind of uh of a uh a modality he's supposedly bringing things forward well the latest we have now is that as you know, many, many of the uh, royal family members, a couple hundred at least, apparently have been arrested and are being detained. Now, that means they've been basically held under house arrest. There's a big hotel they're using for that. And the latest we have that came in yesterday, the Daily Mail reported from the UK that American Blackwater mercenaries and other mercenaries have been hired by uh, Prince Mohammed bin salman mbs as he is known accent on the bs uh to go in there and torture these people uh including uh the brother uh prince awalid bin talal is worth in billions seven or eight billion at least uh he's been hung by his ha- his heels and beaten uh and i think what's going on here ultimately is that mbs is is trying to not so much do a political reformation as he is he's trying to loot the royal family to try to replenish the coffers of the Saudis. It is said that upwards of $800 billion are held by all the royals who have been incarcerated, locked up in this hotel. Uh, that's nearly a trillion dollars that the uh, the royal family, the ruling royal family, would like to have back in the treasury. And they're offering these people, last point, apparently their freedom in exchange for 70% of their wealth. That's the, that's <laughs> well, the deal. So tell us what you know. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I mean, it does seem to be some sort of extortion aspect to it. Um because yeah. yeah, these guys are loaded, especially Bin Talal, biggest uh, shareholder in Citigroup, also the biggest shareholder, well, second biggest shareholder in News Corporation after Rupert Murdoch, which is why I've always said Fox News, uh, well, and the Wall Street Journal, for that matter, owned also by News Corporation, are pretty much uh, Mossad, Saudi intelligence, you know, mind control on the American people. Let me say one other quick thing. It's important and to set the stage for what Dean's going to say. That we all understand, I understand it, and many of you do, that the Saudi royal family, this whole Wahhabi, whatever they are, uh, they're varying descriptions, they're crypto, crypto Jews. They're working for the Zionist state of Israel and the international Zionist Bolshevik uh, organization called banking. They're, they're, they're just messenger boys and, and implementers, and they're slaughtering people in Yemen. They're butchers. And yeah. they're, they're, yeah, go ahead. Well, 
Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, they're, I mean, officially, I'd say the Saudis are the paymaster, right? Because they just fund right. all the covert ops for the city of London. Because, yep. uh, there you go. And whatever, there's some CIA trainers and some Mossad trainers, and there's probably some Taiwanese trainers and whatever, but they just fund it, you know, and they funded it all the way back to Mujahideen in Afghanistan. They, they funded that whole thing. I don't know how much money Prince uh, Bandar bin Sultan gave personally, even just in that arena. And also he gave a bunch of money to the Contras. He gave, they gave a bunch of money to Mozambique, Renamo, the right wing thugs that overthrew the revolutionary government there. They, they funded Savimbi in Namibia, the right wing thug who overthrew. Well, and then <laughs> was over, well, I tried to overthrow, yeah. actually didn't overthrow in Angola because Del Santos and the Socialist Workers Party are still in power there. But that's where Castro fought with his boys in Guevara. And anyway, this goes way back to Saudi paymaster role. And it's been secret. And now that it's public, more and more people are connecting the dots and going, oh, I see they work with Israel. That's why they would only give Hamas licenses and not the PLO, not the uh, yep. Front for the Liberation of Palestine, you know, nationalist left-wing part movements. No, they give it to Hamas, which is basically an Islamist organization, right? Yep. And they did that for years. And the Israelis would grant those licenses only to Hamas. They probably created this latest division between Hamas and and the PLO, um, which is now actually coming back together, interestingly, in Palestine, which is a good thing. But, yeah, I mean, they, they steer all that. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, everything since uh, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, everything in between. In every theater, Morocco, um, you name it, they were funding uh, counter-revolutionaries. Chad against Gaddafi, they funded uh, guys come in from Chad and went after Gaddafi, you know, because ExxonMobil owns pretty much the whole country of Chad still. And, you know, so it's the same old stuff. Um, I think part of it's this internecine family thing, you know, between the, they're all Sudari clan, but there's the Abdullah part of that clan, and there's the Ben Salman part of that clan, and so there's some of that. There's some extortion. They are broke. They, the Saudi economy is in terrible shape um, because the oil price thing they tried to work out to punish Iran, and Russia actually backfired and hurt the Saudi economy the most. There's also a separate crackdown going on against dissidents, not just this royal family right now. And, yeah, under the guise of, oh, we're going to let women drive and we're going to do these progressive you know, things. It's, it's just uh, window dressing. Window dressing. What he's, exactly. It's window dressing because what he's doing is he's doing a crackdown. Um, and he says he's not Wahhabi. You know, he's, he's, he's a moderate. But oh, everything he's doing acts like yeah. a Wahhabi. I mean, hanging somebody by the feet right. and whatever. I mean, you know, so... <laughs> Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I think he's, it's what's scary to me is that the personality of this guy and the personality of Trump are such that I think they're good buddies, see? And I mm -hmm. think there's definitely, uh, the U.S. is definitely behind this in some way. I agree. And, yes. Yeah. And uh, Citigroup has honestly always been the weak sister of the four from the banking, the other three being J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. And they're the one that's kind of been set up to fail. Their balance sheet's horrible. Um, so, and they didn't get anything. They didn't get Merrill Lynch. They didn't get Bear Stearns. They didn't get any of the goodies. You know, when all these vultures moved in in '08 and took over these smaller, you know, Washington Mutual and all these companies, they didn't get nothing. Citigroup didn't get anything because they've been offloading shares to the Saudis see, over the years and the Kuwaitis. And I think it's a ship that could easily be sunk. And the Rothschilds and the and the Rockies are probably kind of slurred out of that one pretty good. So um, there's that, and he's, you know, be it this uh, Bin Talal, he's number one shareholder in the Citigroup. So I think Trump's saying, shake these guys down, get your economy in shape, and mainly be hawkish. And today, you know, he called the Ayatollah of Iran the new Hitler. Oh, know? please, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and that's their whole Hariri thing. His resignation was a staged event to basically create propaganda towards Iran. Because they said that's who's going to kill me, and you know, blah blah blah, and, and that's they're causing trouble because Hezbollah won the elections in Lebanon, which had nothing to do, honestly, with Iran. I mean, they're just popular. They Correct. won the elections, yep. <laughs> so Absolutely. that's what happens in elections. Yeah. Um, well, it's what's supposed to happen, not here, but um, so it's just, and they, so they go after the weak sister there. They go after Hezbollah. You're not going to go directly confront Iran. They know they'd get their butts kicked for one thing, and. Uh, so they go after Hezbollah. They're going to try to do some little. But it's it's also backfire because everybody in Lebanon, even the people who supported uh, Hariri, whose 
father's death, by the way, was also really fishy, you know, and they blame that. And oh, he on was murdered. Syria. And oh, I think man. it was a total Mossad job yeah. um, to pin it and, and to pin it on Syria for propaganda. And that happened right before the whole Syria intervention. If you think about it, it wasn't very long well, later. That's, that's you know, right. It was right before that. They yes. It. Yeah. 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 In Lebanon. And, uh, you know, it was right there. It was like, you know, and boom, then Syria gets attacked. So, you know, it's definitely ominous sign, meaning that, you know, this foreign policy, uh, if, if, I mean, if they're behind it, and I think they are, that the U.S. sort of, then it's bad. It's even worse. And, um, it could, uh, I don't know, There's. it's really, I mean, with Qatar, the situation in Qatar, with Turkey now firmly in the camp of Russia and Iran on the whole Syria situation, um, things are changing, you know. I mean, there's Lebanon now totally in that camp, Qatar in that camp. I mean, there's a lot of people in that camp. And the more the Saudis do stupid stuff like this, the more people leave their camp. And this looks to me like Saudi Arabia is going to be increasingly marginalized. And if they go to war with Iran, they will be defeated. And I'm not so sure the U.S. would step in because they know the Russians might step in. Oh, I think that's they would step the, that's in. That's the biggest question of all, of course. Uh, if, it's, Put, if Putin over, steps in, it's, it's done. Uh, it's game over. They, and the Russians yeah. aren't going to let Iran get invaded by the U.S. They're, I don't think so. They didn't let Syria get invaded. Well, they kind of did through guerrilla forces, but they rolled them back. But they're, now they won't know. Uh, I think the, re- the relationship between um, Putin's Russia and Iran is, is, is probably more powerful than most anyone understands. I think it's yeah, very strong. Yeah, most anyone understands, exactly. It is, and especially in the West. Yeah. We're so, guessing, but I think it's a very good guess. No, it's. I think you're right on it. I don't. It's more than a guess. I think it's true. And but you know, so it's a. But it's just you know, yeah, it's a crazy situation, and all that in what a couple of days, all that happened, all that crazy stuff happened, and still, um, well, yeah, this, we don't really know. We got to remember that the Saudi thing. They first they said it was a, a crackdown on corruption, and then there was talk about how there was an attempted coup. This probably was an attempted coup. We don't know for sure, but they keep saying it's we're cleaning things up. It's it's to uh, root out corruption. Right. No, that isn't it at all. It's it's no, all it's lies. So. It's all lies. Yeah, you're you're right about the money thing. It's a big one because their economy is destroyed. Eight hundred, uh, almost a trillion dollars. They uh, they can extort mm-hmm. from these these yep. princes and princesses, yeah. and yeah. they're all being held in in in, in the Ritz Carlton hotel there mm-hmm. in Riyadh, mm-hmm. uh, apparently. And, yeah. uh, you know, if Americans are in, engaging in torture overseas, that carries a jail sentence of 20 years uh, mm-hmm. if Americans commit torture. Yep. Uh, I didn't know that, but I, I just read it recently. And, yeah, so, what, well, you know, Blackwater. Yeah, not to mention Yemen. I mean, you know, not even to mention what they're doing in well, Yemen. I mean, they're blocking off humanitarian aid when yeah. you have a, basically a famine in you know, happening, it's not coming, it's happening, a famine. I mean, Correct. a huge yeah. million people die kind of famine in in Yemen and blockading all these, it's just barbaric. And you talk about, you know, the new... Well, we've got to remember the Saudis, uh, they cut hands barbaric. and feet off and they uh, they behead people oh, yeah. on the streets, on the corners. That's they what they care. do. Yeah, no, no they brutal. don't care. They're they shouldn't brutal. shouldn't be our allies, and neither should no. Israel. No. And that's that, you know. And, but, you know, I don't yeah. know. I just, I'd like to believe there's a chance that, you know, the Tillerson or whatever, they'd go the other way on this. But it seems like they're pretty behind him. And, you know, like I say, this kid, he's kind of young. We'll, you know, bra- get the braggadocio, whatever, you know, kind of. And I can just see him, Trump, hitting it off. See? And they're saying, look. And, oh, by the way, another thing that happened in those two days, uh, Aramco was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> that's right. That was supposedly part of the deal. Uh, that well, was yeah, made. it was. That's a, that's a, exactly right. And he's like, well, if you just put it on the NYSE, we'll just kind of look the other way when you do this thing and something like that. And, uh, oh, by the way, and they don't mind because, the, yeah, they don't what they the last thing the U.S. wants, the biggest thing they've always worried about in Saudi Arabia, because it's not a country as much as it's just an oil colony, you know. And the, the biggest thing they've always worried about is, a, is an uprising, a revolution from the Saudi people. Mm-hmm. And if you leave this economy in tatters for too long, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's also exactly why he's doing the domestic crackdown on dissidents, because and they're turning the other way on that, too, because people are very disgruntled right now, especially with what he's just done. And, you know, it's pretty blatant, pretty obvious um, that, yeah, it's not. But so they're trying to funnel that money to the to the Saudi people, infrastructure, you know, whatever, free, uh-huh. whatever they do, just to appease them. Um 
for Christ's sakes, they don't even, I mean, when the U.S. trained the Saudis in the 50s, 60s stuff, you know, to defend Aramco's oil fields, they didn't even allow Saudi pilots to pilot the F-16s they gave them or sold them or whatever it was, traded them for 30-year treasury bonds, mm-hmm. change of computer thing, done. But anyway, um, they wouldn't even let the Saudis fly those things because, you know, they're, that's, they'd always worry about whether well, there'd be an insurrection and these pilots would come and bomb the royal palace. So they trained Pakistanis to do it. Pakistani pilots in the Saudi Air Force. Huh. Huh. That's right. how worried they are yeah. about that. So that's a big part of it. Because um, there's a lot of sh- there's Shiites in Saudi Arabia too, and there's sympathy right. for Iran. And, you know, there's there's that. There's stuff in Bahrain obviously going on. Um, and these kings, I mean, their days are numbered. I think. I mean, it's just a relic. The relics. It's just the game's up. You know. I mean, you know. Here's you know, another aspect that we, we don't want to forget and and need to mention and. And that is that somehow, and I don't have all the I's dotted or T's crossed, but there's a big Saudi Arabian aspect to what happened in Las Vegas. No question. Everybody knows that now. Top five floors of the Mandalay Bay, owned by the royal family. Uh, Al Walid uh, is the owner of the top five floors. Uh, Wally, we call him Wally. I have a file diver in much of well, yeah, Wally owns the top five floors. That's the Four Seasons. And it is said by some that MBS uh, was over on holiday in Las Vegas because he's going to be king pretty soon. He won't be able to sneak out of the country. So he went over to play and, and have fun in Vegas. And it is thought that he might have been set up to stay in the top five floors and there could have been an elimination of MBS by Wally. Uh, mm-hmm. who was in line for, for the throne until he was uh, displaced, and MBS was put in there by uh, old King Salman. So, mm-hmm. I, I, But there's a big factor there. Mm-hmm. They, they, people oh, yeah. just I don't talk that. about that. Yeah, the top five floors. Top five floors, wow. It's all, it's, it might as well be the, the Saudi embassy. You don't get in there. Yeah, yeah it's a restaurant, but uh, uh-huh, it, it's uh-huh. their territory. That's the way wow. it works, especially in corrupt Las Vegas. It is really interesting. So they probably definitely had there was some element of that going on. Well, we have video yeah, just, now of uh, two helicopters uh, flying around with muzzle flash coming from mm-hmm. underneath. Uh, they were shooting. We mm-hmm. got uh, two videos of ground shooting, ground teams. I've got all that up there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. They, they were. this was a very sophisticated operation. Paddock probably never fired a shot, didn't know what the hell was going on. They set him up, and, and uh, Lee Harvey Oswalded him, and that sure, was it. Of course. Yeah, right across from the... We got, uh, by the way, we got video of muzzle flash coming from seven stories above Paddock Suite from the Saudi-owned five top floors. Wow. Mm-hmm. So they were shooting at something from up there in the top. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So something's They're going crazy. on. They're crazy. I mean, the Saudis are crazy, and... Uh... They just do stuff. They're just, they've been emboldened because, you know, we've let them do it. I mean, we let them do 9 11, oh, man. Absolutely. I mean, how bad is that? I mean, and you don't yeah. even cut ties with them. You just actually, you know, Bush just smokes a cigar with Prince Bandar as they, you know, carry, whisk the family out of the country. I mean, how, bla- you know, and how much, it's just like letting Israel get away with the USS Liberty or 9 11 because they were part of it too. I mean, how, how long are you Americans going to take this shit? Yeah. That's what I want to know from these yeah. assholes. Sorry, yeah. the French, but I mean that they are. They're just brutes. They're no goods, man. And we have no reason to be allied with them. And it's just, oh yeah, thirty-year treasury bonds and oil. Well, big deal, man. Iran has got just as much oil. Um, Iraq, you put Iran and Iraq together, they got more oil. You be friends with Venezuela, you're all set. So why can't you just, you know, get your friends straightened out here? And but you know, we know why. It's just the bankers, and and it's right. their thirty-year treasury bonds. Friends, not they good own enough. The, bond market. the bankers so, want to own it. They got to own part of their it. scheme, and so you know, it's just a, it's a, it's what's kept the petrodollar rolling. And they know that the minute they dump the Saudis, petrodollar is gone forever. Probably going to be a new economic balance globally, you know, with Russia and uh-huh. Iran and those countries. Well, they just wars. crowned so Putin today. Uh, crowned, crowned Putin as world energy czar today. Mm. He's formally number one. Uh-huh. You mean uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah. He has the most oil. Yep. Yeah, I think that's right in the end. Yeah, they just hadn't discovered it all yet for this harsh country. And a lot of the U.S. companies had contracts in Siberia, but they, you know, Putin canceled some of those too when they ransacked Russia in 98. And he went 
back and canceled a lot of that stuff. Right. So, uh, but yeah, I believe it. And they're sitting on it, and that's the thing. Caspian and see all that stuff, uh, being friends with Iran, being friends. I mean, it's a big, yeah, it's the end game here in the Middle East, you know, is what it is. After probably 100 years of Balfour Declaration, Treaty of Jeddah, what, five years after that? Uh-huh. With the Saudis uh, turning them <laughs> pearl divers into our clients, because all them—that's what they were. All these sedaries are just pearl divers, man. And we we're like, here, here's a billion dollars or whatever. You're the new king, and you run stuff. And all you gotta do is take orders, and and they did. And um, same thing. Yeah. You know, so it's it's coming up. The gig's up. The hundred year gig is maybe up. Uh, maybe it's not coincidence. You only know, got the Balfour Declaration, hundred years. Well, watch uh, watch for uh, MBS to be king here within the next week or two. I think that's the way, that'll every be the indication. Next week. Russian President Vladimir Putin, uh, according to uh, RT, which is a good news service, by the way, in mm -hmm. case any of you have been buying into the lies. Uh, mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin has been easily. Uh, the most influential player in the organization of petroleum exporting countries, OPEC, since Russia agreed to the uh, cartel to cap crude output nearly a year ago. He is uh, apparently calling all the shots. This is according to one OPEC official, and it's, uh, it's Vladimir Putin. Now the oil czar of the world. That's what they're saying. Is Russia a member of OPEC, officially? I guess they'd have to be. Mm hmm. You know do, that. Do some more research. That's big, too. Yeah. All right. Hold on. Uh, Dean and I will be right back. Okay, back to Dean. Uh, Russia has been involved with OPEC for years, but they are not formally a member. So that's uh, that's the fact of the matter. In but fact, they're coming a bit more involved. They're in very way. heavily involved. Mm -hmm. um, Good. Alexander. Novak, the Russian energy minister, said that uh, in March, this is quite a while, it's coming on a year ago now, he said, our cooperation with the oil exporting countries has proven to be necessary and very useful. So they're, they're involved, but I, I don't know how much trust there is between the two, but it's, uh, yeah. Certain members, I'm sure there's a lot of trust, certain ones, like the Saudis, yeah. there isn't a lot yeah. of trust, probably. You know, but I'm sure, you know, of course, Iran, Iraq, I remember OPEC. OPEC's always had these two factions, you know, and uh, it was always the price hawks, they called them. And that was like Iran, Iraq, Algeria, Libya, Venezuela, Nigeria, um, Indonesia. No. Poor countries, mm -hmm. developing countries, in debt, need a lot of revenue, wanted a high oil price. And then you had the swing producer Saudis and the Shah of Iran was in that category until the revolution. And um, those guys kept the oil price low for the West, mm -hmm. and um, they were mm -hmm. called the price doves. Mm -hmm. But they're, but you know everybody knows that Saudi really runs OPEC. That's the thing, and they have for many years. Oh, just Aramco, of, of course. Yeah, yeah. The virtue, of, yeah, exactly the size I, of Aramco and the volume of oil they pump. So that's been the problem. So it would be really helpful if Russia would get more involved. That was a big thing in '73 when they. Really, that whole oil crisis, you know, was all fabricated, and they used that to really break OPEC and, you know, really uh, break the, the price hawk faction. Of that's OPEC, what that's that what it was done for, exactly. Yeah. and they did try to break it, and they had the whole committee committee for steadfastness and confrontation. I think was the name of the group led by Gaddafi, huh. and they were demanding, you know, fair oil prices, you know, and all this. And Syria, Iran, Iraq were all members of it. Of Algeria under Bomadine, you know, he was pretty radical leader that really tried to wrest the oil and the, and the natural gas in Algeria away from these guys because they got a lot of that. Uh -huh. State oil company, Sound Track. I haven't heard that name in a long time. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah funny. I know. Here, now, let of... me ask you a question. What is your understanding about the, the reserves of oil that the Saudis actually have? Uh, I've read between 650 and 800 billion barrels. You know, I'm not current on that. The last I remember seeing was like 255, and they were. And the next number two was Iraq at about 105. 105 you know, billion. That's been a while, but that's been a while. Huh. Yeah, but double. I mean, Saudi had double of even the next biggest. You know, but now, I mean, I, I really honestly, I'm kept track of that. I think uh, you've said I think Venezuela may have the biggest reserves now. Absolutely. Yeah. You let know? me let so, me look and see oh, here. Even though it's heavy crude. You know, there's a lot of it. They're different grades. It changes. They have, and, they, you yeah. know, these guys hide it from us, too. I mean, you know, oh, like sure. Aramco, that's where Valerie Plume, you know, was going. I mean, she was a spy, and she was 
going into Saudi Aramco, and I think maybe she was trying to find out stuff like that, you know, like about oil reserves, because this was a time when, you know, some people were taking the peak oil thing serious, and they wanted to know, like, how much oil is actually in Gawar oil field, you know, the, by far the biggest oil field in the world. Um, and then they did the whole, you know, cake, whatever, yellow cake uranium thing, and destroyed her reputation. That was interesting, because that a set up, but she set up, I think she was. Mm-hmm. Uh, to discredit her and what she was doing because she was working for the State Department as kind of, I think, a spook. Maybe CIA even. I think it was CIA. And she was in Aramco and, and, you know, who knows? But it's all, they don't want you to know how many reserves there are. That's the thing. So um, it's hard to find that information out accurately and to be here, accurate. Here you, here's it. what we have formally yeah. uh, online right now. The, the proven oil reserves of Saudi Arabia are the second largest in the world, estimated to be mm-hmm. 268 billion barrels. Yeah, right. that's about what, 255 was what I remember. You were right. Yeah. Uh, okay, now, as far yeah, as... Number one, was that Russia then? Well, it's, it's Russia, or, but, but uh-huh. is it? Uh, Venezuela yeah, right. uh, proven reserves slowly increased to reach 80 billion barrels by 2005, uh, but then they began to grow exponentially as oil prices rose, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. The country's proven reserves reached 297 billion, mm-hmm. which surpasses Saudi Arabia, there leaping you know. over the Saudis to become the country with the yeah. world's largest crude oil reserves. Mm-hmm. Now right. we're getting, uh, get this, this is as of April this year. The bulk of Venezuela's oil is on the uh, Orinoco Belt, which yeah. is in the northern part of the country. In fact, according to some estimates, there are are as much as 1.2 trillion barrels of oil in the region. Trillion. That's why Venezuela today is under such duress. We are trying to get that oil. We, with the CIA, wants that oil, and they want to kill off uh, everything down there that will oppose it, and they want to put in their puppet. They had a Zionist puppet they were trying to put in there. Uh, He didn't quite win the election. Maduro's still there. But the, yeah. look, don't sure be wanna. surprised if there was a violent uh, coup being planned and executed by the uh, CIA yeah. anytime. Well, they already one point two, yeah, yeah. one point two yeah. trillion. Uh, even yeah, it's one no, trillion. That's four <laughs> times Saudi Arabia. Okay, right off the, the southern coast of the U.S. I know, I know, and they got the refineries already built at Curacao, which is that little island just north of Venezuela. Oh, How they convenient. do. That's right. How they convenient. built the yeah, refineries. So Exxon Mobil yeah. World Shell, the world's Two biggest oil refineries are on that island of Curacao, and one of each, you know, owns them. And, oh, Exxon, yeah, Creole Petroleum, for years, I mean, ran the country of Venezuela. It was a subsidiary uh, of Exxon Mobil, may still be. And Rockefeller family, they own a big finca in Venezuela, huge finca. They're very, uh, they have very much power in Venezuela via the Cisneros family, which is, they're the biggest, one of the biggest shareholders of Royal Bank of Scotland. And huh. they're Venezuelan oligarchs. They're filthy rich, and they're Rockefeller lieutenants, just like think Kissinger in Venezuela. That's what they are. And and they they're the ones behind all this crap, all the street thugs and shootings and you know violence that they blame on the government and and, and the food shortages. They're behind that because they own the food importers. <laughs> they own everything, you know. So yeah, they're trying to squeeze them and get these leftists out of there, and they want the oil back. The Rockefellers do. <laughs> Pretty simple. So that's what's, yeah, and that, of course, is always the case with, you know, that's why, you know, Iran's our enemy, and they won't give their oil to ExxonMobil for free or whatever. They actually want money for it. Can you imagine? That's the damnedest thing. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Just crazy people, I tell you, those uh, Iranians. Yeah. <laughs> so they're the bad guys. All the bad guys are the good guys, get it? Well, <laughs> All the good I mean, guys are the bad guys. I mean, it's really that simple. And, and the, the statement by MBS that... uh the uh, Grand Ayatollah, or whatever his title is in, in Iran, mm-hmm. is the new yeah. Hitler. How yeah. many times are they going to drag that old dead <laughs> war horse out and try and make it stand up again? That's embarrassing <laughs> yeah, to say something that's needed, dumb. I guess. I think they did that to Noriega, didn't they, or something? Or Saddam, or both? Or... Oh, it's Saddam, for sure. And, no, there have been a bunch of them. Mm-hmm. They got, who was the guy Milosevic, in Yugoslavia? Yeah, Milosevic. Milosevic, yeah, yeah he was yeah. one. Uh, yeah. I see they finally caught up with Rock Kamladic, but uh, I don't know. They you and I are the only uh, two who sure. haven't been called a new Hitler. I, mean, I haven't, really. <laughs> well, I need to get with it, man. <laughs> that's right. We're lagging. We're lagging. I'm lagging. Um, 
I'm always lagging, man. I was half step behind. <laughs> right, Russia's proven oil reserves are, and I don't expect these figures to be remotely accurate, are said to be a little over 100 billion barrels, but I've heard mm -hmm. way higher figures than that. I think so, too. I think in the end, Russia has more than Venezuela, although if Venezuela's got trillions, that's a lot, <laughs> you know. 1.2 trillion, lot. that's what yeah, they that's say. And these are petrochemical engineers making these projections, yeah. geologists. Yeah, so, interesting. Yeah. Well, that's definitely what's at stake there. And um, for years, you know, like I say, they have in the bag. I mean, it's a really recent thing that Venezuela has fallen under these evil leftists, you know. So before that, I mean, yeah, it was all Rockefeller all the time, but I don't think they discovered a lot of that, plus a lot of that Orinoco oil and the Lake Maracaibo is where a lot of it is. They're drilling that. They got oil rigs all over that lake, and uh, mm -hmm. it's heavy oil. So I think the with the recent increases, just like with the tar sand sea, that right. became more viable. And maybe they even a added shale, the shale reserves. too. Uh, yeah, the same with shale. Yeah, and you know, and of course now the price is down. Well, that's another reason Venezuela is suffering a little bit, and that was the point. You know, that was the point. I mean, when it was a hundred dollars uh, a barrel, Venezuela had food on the shelves and. You know, Chavez had a big bankroll right. and could, you know, right. give more free education and more whatever he's done. And, he's done. and he did a lot. And Maduro's doing a lot, too, for those people. Because I, I was in Venezuela twice before that, and it was some of the god-awful worst squalor you could ever see in Caracas. And just a few rich people on the bottom running everything. And the, Chavez the changed that, didn't he? Just shacks. And he did change that. People have new houses. People have new water. Look at the, look at the reward he got. They're very educated. They sent out literacy brigades, mm -hmm. all these things, because they kept them stupid, 90% illiterate, just like they do. That's what they do. And and once the people are educated, then they can fight back. So it's going to be good luck getting Venezuela back. That's all I'm going to say, because I think that I feel like, especially with this latest thing where Maduro held these guys off with this constitutional thing, I think it's over. I mean, it's, it's that was a very big, people now. big they development. Like Huge. That was a big development. There's been uh, a lot of those in the, on the world stage, and that's why, again, you know, I was talking about, you know, it's easy to lose hope in the U.S., but globally, there's a lot. I mean, look at the thing in Zimbabwe. I mean, look, the guy needed to go. He's 93. He's probably, right. you know, but he did a lot for his country because, again, I was there, and I, I never met anybody in South Africa as educated as the Zimbabwe people. Every single one of them I talked to, cab drivers. I mean, they were the most educated people. Uh, look how this went down. Bloodless. Mm. Um, Lacoste mm -hmm. took over. The only people going to be disappointed here are the international bankers because Grace Mugabe, I think, might have been working with them. And that's why Lacoste came back, the Viet vice president tossed out, and that was her doing that. And she, she was the leader of this G40 faction, which is you know kind of a new thing. And the old guard, the old people, you know, the people that fought with Zana PF to drive the Rhodesians out. Um, you know, these are Rhodes people. <laughs> um, basically, uh, you know, they're Lacoste, and that's the vice president, that's now president. I can't even pronounce his name. No, I can't either. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to wait for somebody else but to take that chance. Somebody first. else can do that. Um, mm -hmm. But um, anyway, it's a, but look how it went down. It was bloodless. It was peaceful. Right. It shows that they were educated, civilized people. That were they all that. It shows that the revolution in, in Zimbabwe was a success. Right. And well, they uh, gave a success, but they're not going to give. Once they figure out, you know, these guys think now that oh, this guy it's going to be all different. Some of them might think that, but this guy's even more hardline than Mugabe. I mean, the coast is the old guard, man. It's they're not going to cozy up to Barclays or anything, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So they're actually probably, you know, going to take, take, you know, use the resources. And I hope, I hope to God the country can can make a comeback because it's rich in resources. And these bankers have just kept it down, blamed everything on Mugabe, and he's, you know, he wasn't perfect, but like I say, I think he did a lot for his people. And so he's one of those bad guys. It's a good guy. So just so people know that, even though okay, he's ninety three, he might have went up, you know, and he's in there too long. Thirty seven years, give me a break, go. You know, just go. Go have fun. Go do go something fun. else. I mean, you're 93. I'm well, they a cool gave him a, a have, dude, you know? yeah. so, They yeah, gave him a free pass. And, and, not and gonna, they, yeah. yeah, there you go. And interesting, you know, the wife fled right away. Grace oh, that, that was a joke. Yeah, I, I, I fled laughed. right away to Namibia. So I think they, you know, I think they were on to something. Lacoste was on to something. They, it was good they did what they did because I think it was a banker thing and she would have been the next president. And then, yeah, then they would have sold them down. You know what you said about the, the uh, new refineries? Uh, what was yeah. the name of the island again? Curacao. Curacao? All Curacao, right. Yeah. Curacao. We have, uh, you know, when the last refinery 
in the U.S. was built yeah, right. Long in the mid-1970s. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, how that's stupid is that? How stupid is that? I know. Take the processing offshore value unadded, I guess, mm -hmm. or... But, you know, of course, of course they will, because they can pay a guy in Curacao, like, whatever, a dollar a day or whatever, you know. Got to right. pay a guy in Port Arthur 100 bucks a day or whatever. So, yeah, of course, they did all that. And then they ended up selling all those old refineries to Valero Energy, and they're just a liability. And I think Valero, I've, I've seen them going around now, Valero, buying up BP and Shell gas stations, and then they'll just shut down. And I think Valero... Wait, they, wait, wait, wait. Uh, they, Valero buys up stations and just mm -hmm. shuts them down? And oh. then they shut down. What are they Obama. using for write-offs? Yeah, I, I think it's a Saudi kind of golden parachute thing, maybe, where they did this in Houston with the commercial property market in the 80s when mm -hmm. Mossbacher and all these, you know, they became Baker, James Baker, all of them became Bush officials later. But mm -hmm. the Houston real estate market was really depressed, so the Saudis came in and just basically bought all this overpriced property, took it off their hands at inflated prices. Mm -hmm. And so then they let the Saudis fly $100 bills to the Cayman Islands and whatever, do some drug trade, I suppose. And whatever, whatever they do, whatever mm -hmm. their part of it was, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fun, fun, you know, some, yeah. And so and I think that maybe that's going on again with this thing, mm. you know, it's just like some kind of Valero, you know, being maybe a Saudi held entity, they got to check into it, but they sold them all the refineries and they're just, I mean, yeah. they're just, they all needed upgrades so with the new EPA laws, well, they're that, all going to be fine. I mean, you know, There's and so all the big boys, yeah, they exited the refining business. I don't know when it was, 90s kind of, I think. We we have a, a Valero here, uh, not far, uh -huh. and I ha I use them exclusively. You know why? They're uh -huh. the only station selling ethanol-free gasoline, uh, yeah. real gasoline yeah. that won't destroy yeah, your engine. Stuff. Uh -huh. And, and no. you know you don't put in anything, especially a two-cycle uh -huh. engine, uh, your uh -huh. lawnmower, f four cycle yeah. doesn't matter. You will destroy <laughs> it. Your Harley never put. It. A, a, no, it'll ruin it. I agree. Uh, it, and they it. won't tell you about it. Now, Harley had to cover their butt somehow, so what they did was they said uh, 90 percent gas, ten percent ten percent ethanol was okay, but uh, mm -hmm. don't use gas with fifteen percent ethanol because that's bad. So <laughs> you know, it's yeah. funny. It's all bad, uh, folks. And I only put uh, <laughs> ethanol-free gas in my my vehicle and and my bike. That's, I won't put anything else in it. No yeah, way. Man. Not a and it, cool. They run better. You can actually yeah. feel them running better. I, I don't know if oh, you yeah, have it there, do. but... No, they do. Yeah. It's, that stuff is... It's no garbage. And it's, it's corn. just what a waste of energy. I mean, stupid, man, to... Totally take stupid. corn and just... Totally lug stupid. it around and make well, just a little bit of fuel off. You know, it's GMO corn, too, people. Dean, and that's yeah, another GMO problem. Corn. So what the hell? I don't want to eat it, but I don't want to see it going into fuel. I wonder what's coming out the tailpipe. I don't know. Yeah, right. I know, really. Um, no, seriously. <laughs> so it's bad. I wonder who owned, uh, <clears throat> do you remember who owned that Valero before? Or was it owned before? By uh, yeah, it was owned show? by somebody else. I can't remember. Uh, that's what I think they're doing. And yeah, some of them they don't shut down, and some of them they do have notice. But that was like in, uh, I don't know, 2005 to 10, maybe when BP and Shell started buying gas stations. And that's right before the gas price went up. So they they were they didn't used to mess with gas stations because that's a low you know margin thing. You probably right. do that. Right. And they make money selling more potato chips. So but well, you make up what a penny a gallon or something. Yeah, or... whatever. But but when gas went up to four fifty, that changed. And so then right before that, that's when BP and Shell came in and bought all these gas stations. And so they owned the whole thing all the way from the wellhead to the gas. You know who runs there. most of the gas stations? Yeah. Iranians. Yeah, yeah. It's heavy into the gas station business. That's interesting, right? I wonder if they're like these right wing Iranians that flood the revolution. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, no, probably because I'm on for the CIA and that over here. I used to work for an ice cream truck. Uh, I drove an ice cream truck in Minneapolis, and the Iranians that owned it, I'm pretty sure they were like, I was really young, but I'm pretty did sure. Did you Did like, you run an ice cream truck? I did. Yeah, I rang that little bell, you know, and uh, went to Good park. Good for you. And, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was something to do. Yeah, Back when fun. parents could still trust their kids to run out to the ice cream man. Now you don't do I that. Know. Yeah, yeah they grab the kids and they're gone. <laughs> yeah, maybe the ice cream man will have to have like a, you know, like a censored up. Thing, I don't you know. know <laughs> drive through something or yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. we used to have a nice. What a nice. Terrible. We had a nice quality of life here at one point. Oh could, man, that's yeah. right. I mean, well, we can do it again, but it's just going to take. I don't know. People well, pull their heads out. Well, remember what, what 
we get out of the White House now. Uh, uh, <laughs> several stories that Trump is is uh, telling uh, Jared, don't call me Jerry Kushner and Mrs. Kushner, Princess Ivanka, to leave the White House and move back to New York. Really? Yes. Well, that could be a good start. <laughs> it's a start. I know the little punk uh, the little has baby. been little, <laughs> yep. the little cool. Mossad mouse has been. Uh, if you look uh, at his face sometime and listen to him talk. Yeah, he's he's really a tweak. Yeah, yeah, it's something yeah. Wrong. <laughs> yeah, he's a little freak, man. I know Lizzie. It's like that John Kelly or whatever. He looked at him and he's like, Lizzie. <laughs> yeah, they're all. <laughs> I look. can see him. You know, I think you can see him. Okay, kind of the lizards. They look like lizards. I mean, it's not. They a do. Joke. They do. <laughs> well, anyway, J- Jerry Kushner to me looks uh, very much uh, uh, <laughs> feminine. He's he's. Uh, Jerry. Yeah, very public in Jerry Kushner, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Seems like it. But that's that's what they want, I thought. Look, they want men to be feminine and women to be masculine, right, Jeff? Well, there's on, your role model, right. I know. I you got know we're supposed to be going for these yeah. Illuminatis. I guess we should start lisping pretty over. soon, is that it? Should we, should we lisp? Maybe, yeah. When we talk? Just be a little more meek, maybe. Keep those, <laughs> keep those wrists loose and... Uh, yeah. I think that's the only way that we're going to survive, man. They're going to round us up. But, uh, oh, well. Yeah. Round me up, I guess. <laughs> On second thought. But, well, um, you know, nah, the, I, I guess we'll, we'll get to see President Trump light the national Christmas tree. He'll be, well, he's be probably fun. looking forward to that. Yeah. And he'll say I'll Merry be, Christmas over and over again. And hope he doesn't torch it, start on a big fire or something. Well, we got, we got people he in this country who do it. Else, so, you know, no big deal. <laughs> Was my fool? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, That's boy. funny. Good lesson for the kids. You know? <laughs> That's right. All right. Uh, a quick view, a quick look in our last minute over at uh, North Korea. Uh, it, 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 China's playing the game here. I don't think the West, I don't think we have a, much of a chance against China and, and its, its chicanery and its stealth. They're running the show over there. No one's talking about it much, but they're heavy, heavy into this. Yeah, and he's got Trump in his back pocket. This uh, oh, gee, oh, yeah. Jinping. I mean, yeah, looked like they, they were just good best buddies over there. Best pals. Playing like a fiddle, you know, really. But yeah, you I know, um, it's a two-way street because Walmart's China and China's Walmart. Don't forget. And uh, we, Black Friday, yeah, we man, will how see. How can we forget? You know. I I guess <laughs> you didn't go out today, huh? Nope. <laughs> Did not. How about yourself? That's funny. Oh, my goodness. Right. Yeah, I guess there was a fight in Alabama and one in Missouri. Was what I heard. Well, we get those <laughs> annual videos. I, we I, make the news again. God, yeah. embarrassing, really. Indeed. But, oh, well. All right. Dean, <laughs> listen, uh, thanks for everything. Uh, talk to you next month. And, uh, good, Jeff. Thank I you guess, for having uh, me. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk to you right before Christmas, it looks like. Sounds good, my friend. You All have right. a good one in the interim. Thanks, Take Dean. Care. You All be right, well. Man. Bye-bye. All right. Mr. Dean Henderson. And, uh, yeah, a lot of good information in that hour for you to think about. We will take a little bit of a break and come right back with hour number two.